Welcome to IT Visionaries, created by The Mission, your number one source for accelerated learning. Neil Kumar is the CTO at Carrot. Think of Carrot as your trusted interview engineer that makes it easy to interview and vet top-tier technical talent. As one of the original team members, Neil's hands-on experience and passion for building and managing large engineering teams has helped guide the development of Carrot and helped large companies solve their number one challenge finding, hiring, and retaining the best technical talent. Neil knows a thing or two about this. As one of the first 12 employees at Yelp, Neil grew the engineering team from himself to over 200 engineers. In this episode, we talk about best practices for any companies who are hiring technical talent, including how to speed up the hiring process, eliminate bias, and improve the candidate experience. IT Visionaries is brought to you by the Lightning Platform by Salesforce. The Lightning Platform is a leading cloud platform that makes building AI-powered apps faster and easier. With Salesforce, now everyone is empowered to build apps for their organization. Learn more at salesforce.com slash build apps. Neil, what's going on? Not too much. How are you doing? You know, it is a great day here in sunny Palo Alto. I'm super excited to talk to you today. We have a ton of insights about hiring technical talent, hiring engineers, and best practices for IT leaders. But first, I want to talk about what you're doing at Carrot. Can you explain the company and what your role is? Absolutely. So Carrot is the world's leader in conducting first-round technical interviews, which basically means we help software companies such as Intuit, Indeed, Roblox, Pinterest, hire software engineers by helping them assess for technical talent. We are a startup based out of Seattle, and we've been at this for about four or five years now. And Neil has an extensive background from hiring hundreds and hundreds of engineers. He was one of the first 12 employees at Yelp. Can you kind of explain what your process was early on at Yelp, how you were kind of the person that became the go-to guy for hiring, for bringing on technical talent, for building that pipeline? Like, Explain all that stuff. Yeah, so I joined Yelp really early on, you know, when there was 12 people there. And at that time, the two co-founders were both engineers. One was the CEO and one was playing the CTO. And neither really wanted to manage a engineering team. So I, I started as an individual contributor and, and really kind of quickly took over managing the engineering team. And I learned really quickly that as a VP of engineering, your main role is to hire. And so I had to really quickly learn the ropes of building an engineering team and how to do phone screens and how to do on-sites and and roundtables and how to, at the same time, create a culture that's inviting and that people would be excited to work with and work on. At my time at Yelp, one of the things that happened was our technical recruiter that I had worked with in the early years, left the company and moved on. And we had this sort of gap where we had no technical recruiters. But at the same time, I was still tasked with a lot of hiring. And as an engineer, I took that on as a challenge and became a technical recruiter. And I ended up building a technical recruiting team within my engineering organization, which is, I think, a little bit odd. But through that process, I learned a lot about recruiting and how to source candidates and how to close candidates. And that's given me a really interesting background of having been on both sides of the technical hiring, both the engineering and the HR recruiting side. What's really interesting, too, is you were dealing with hiring really elite level talent to compete in a time that was extremely competitive in this kind of like early mobile app development kind of world. And then also having to hire for volume. I mean, this is right at the same time when Facebook is blowing up. Twitter's blowing up, like all these things right around you where you're having to hire all these folks, right? Yeah, you know, I have this kind of funny story. One of the things I thought that would be really cool is if I had my CEO call our candidates in the hiring process, I thought, hey, that would be sort of unique and interesting. And, you know, most candidates when they're interviewing with a company don't really get that exposure. And so we had this candidate who was a college student at Caltech. And I had Jeremy Stoppelman, our CEO, give him a ring and try to sell him on joining Yelp. And Jeremy did that call and he came to me afterwards. He said, well, that was interesting. Yeah, he just got off the phone with Mark Zuckerberg right before me. So I hope I closed it. But that was just really kind of hit home how important hiring was and how competitive it is in the Valley in particular. Not only just in that time period, I think it's risen even far more in 2018. 
You're exactly right. And now you're looking at how do you compete as someone, whether you're a tech company or a non-tech company, how do you compete for a talent pool that is pretty much 100% employed? There's not a lot of stop gaps or there's not a lot of people that are kind of riding out periods of unemployment. And to get really elite folks at whatever city you're in, you need a lot of advantages. I mean, talk to me about that role, that switch from Yelp to Carrot, and what was the opportunity that you all saw? So that switch for me was, you know, as I learned all about recruiting and engineering leadership, and I learned about a lot of the pain points, the opportunity at Carrot was to really address a huge one, which is interviewing. The interviewing part on your team can be really time-consuming. It can take away a lot of that time from building product and really care it by doing those first round interviews for our clients. We're giving that time back to companies. We're allowing them to move faster in their hiring process. We're allowing them to expand the funnel and screen in more candidates than ever before. And that really does give most companies a huge advantage in that war for talent. So if you were to say kind of the four things that could help a CIO or a CTO improve their hiring, starting with the first one, eliminating bias and improving diversity and inclusion. What are some best practices or some things that you've seen in your career at Yelp and at Carrot? Sure. So, I mean, I think it starts at the top of the funnel. Like I was saying before, you really want to cast as wide of a net that you can. You want to be really conscious of removing the unconscious bias. And that means having a very standardized interviewing process being fair and respectful to all candidates. Bias is not just what happens in the interviewing room, but even how the decision is made. You know, teams are really subject to group think, and it's really hard to avoid that. But you can by building roundtable practices where people are seeing the outcomes from the interviews and the on-sites and seeing that separately before they see each other's, which I think also helps a lot in bias. You also have to have a good culture, a culture that's inviting and open to people from different backgrounds. And that doesn't mean gender and skin color, but also in, in different places in life. So in modern times with remote work, we have much more flexibility for you know people with families or with kids, and we can create environments that allow for people to come back to work maybe after they've been on maternity leave or have changed careers. We no longer live in a nine to five, but in seats world. A lot of the work can be done remotely. A lot of the work can be done in different ways and really helping support your employees to have those options. I think that really also helps on diversity. Leadership as well. I mean, I think people want to join companies where, you know, they're not just a token, but they're joining into a group of people that are welcoming them. And your leadership by buying into this from day one and helping setting that tone, but also having diversity in that leadership. Another technique is something that a lot of companies have borrowed from the NFL, the Rooney Rule, which basically states that for every hire that you make, that you have some candidates on the onsite who are from a diverse background so that you're not just interviewing one type of group, but you really have more diversity for people coming on site. And I think that gives your teams a better chance to see more candidates, but also Especially if you combine that with standardized interviewing, I think you'll find that there are a lot of candidates that really have skills that you're looking for, and they don't look like the people that you have today, but really can help your companies move to the future and solve modern problems that we're all facing. Yeah, and to expand on that, this means that you kind of have to go beyond the traditional talent pools that companies might be used to, right? I know that there was an example of the tech company that I know of that... They hire all of their engineers or the vast majority of their engineers early on from like one school. And it's a very unknown remote school that they don't share, that they get a lot of talent from there. But as they scale, they realize like, hey, we couldn't even hire every single graduate. Like, are you seeing some of the companies that you're working with exploring going from outside of the pool traditionally of, you know, those kind of top tier schools or different things like that? Yeah, you know, and I think as startups, when you start on day one, you recruit from your friends, right? I mean, the people that you work with at other places or the schools that you come from. So I think generally in startups, you see like diversity starting as a problem kind of on day one 
because of that. But, you know, definitely you see companies changing the criteria. You know, it's not just Stanford and Berkeley and MIT, but, you know, historically black colleges or state schools in other regions, community colleges. There's sort of a rise of like the coding boot camps. But diversity can be found everywhere, especially in this war of talent. Once you kind of get out of the Berkeleys and Stanfords, you know, there's a lot of opportunities to find really talented people who are quite often mostly missed by the market. And so we do have a lot of our clients will go to different universities than they have before. And with the type of service that we provide, we really give a lot of companies that ability to expand the top of their funnel and really screen in more people than they ever have before. Talk to me about like false negatives and false positives, because I know that that's something that is a huge issue for companies to identify themselves. Like they don't necessarily know what they're looking at when they're hiring engineers specifically. Yeah, I think everybody really focuses on the false positives. So, you know, somebody's resume says, I know Java, but then maybe they don't know Java programming. And that's what a lot of sort of traditional engineering hiring is really based on. But the false negatives are equally as important. A single phone screen or single interview can go in any direction. And maybe the candidate had a bad day or maybe didn't hear the, the interviewer properly. And companies are losing out on great talent on sort of a single data point. And so focusing on the false negatives, one way to do that, that we do, is we offer all candidates a redo. So within 24 hours of an interview, you can have a different set of questions, a different interviewer, and just a, a second chance. And we find that for a lot of candidates, both from our diversity cohorts, but even our senior software engineers who just might be rustier at coding, the sort of redo opportunity gives them a second chance. And for a lot of our clients, they're making great hires out of this pool. So I do think that, you know, the industry really has been focused on false positives, but really false negatives are really equally important. If you think about how much time and money goes into hiring, you know, the false positive, of course, you made a bad hire and, and that's pretty expensive. But the false negative, that, that hire that you could have made is both expensive as well and both the opportunity costs. But, you know, the fact that you have to continue to interview and interview and, and, and find more candidates. I hadn't heard that second chance thing before. That's really interesting that you look at things that way. Do you think that when you give some of those folks, specifically with engineers, I mean, I think that part of this is it's just so technical and so complex, and there are so many new technologies that are out there that I think folks have skill sets that are, like you said, you could just be rusty on something and you just need to brush up on it a little bit. Almost like taking, you know, the GMAT or the GRE, you're like, I need to brush up on algebra. Is that like an apt comparison? It's close. You know, I think the SATs and the GMATs, those are broader tests and it's susceptible to a lot of different things. We're kind of closer to a work sample. Yeah, and kind of what I mean by that is not the test. What I mean more is like you go in there, you, you take the test for the first time, and you're like, oh, I didn't realize what I didn't know, and I need to go back and take it again. Like That just happens in life. Like You just need a redo sometimes because you had the bad day. Not necessarily that like there's a comparison between the actual material. Yeah, no, absolutely. You're right on that. And you know, giving that candidate a second chance, many of them won't even take it, but knowing that if something goes wrong, they can come back and do it again, just kind of reduces a lot of that stress and just even provides a better performance the first time around. It is really stressful to be on the other side of the table in a job interview. I mean, it's a necessary thing, but it's not necessarily the most fun thing. And so anything you can do to reduce that stress will really just give you a much better candidate experience and a better outcome for both sides. You know, that's a great segue into candidate experience. And I think that it's a huge issue with how much I think technology has expanded our awareness of everything that's going on. You know, you can apply for a job really quickly now. You can find a new candidate really quickly. And there's that kind of like urgency to hire. Explain how candidate experience is kind of suffering. Yeah, so... Like I said before, the unemployment rate for software engineers is pretty low. And so candidates can be very choosy and you know, candidate experience really matters to them. It gives you a sense of how that company is going to probably treat them later on, right? That first impression is the interview process when you're making a decision to join a company. So 
for companies that are really trying to attract the best talent, you know, candidate experience is extremely important to get right. And, and that means eliminating what I call the recruiting black hole, which you'll see with a lot of companies where, you know, you apply and you just don't hear back forever and ever. And that's such a... Oh, man. I mean, <laughs> admittedly, like that happens to us sometimes. Like that stuff, it is tough when you have competing priorities and the email inbox is going crazy and all of that. It is tough. And when you're in the moment, when you're the one on the other side of the table, you just want to know that someone has your best interest in heart. That's really what it comes down to, that you can send someone an email, they're going to respond. Absolutely. And for us, candidate experience is really conducting interviews with rigor, humanity, and fairness. And it's really just being thoughtful and respectful for the human on the other side. How did you do that at Yelp? Because you had so many interviews. I mean, you hired hundreds of engineers. Like, how did you bring personalization into that experience? Well, we made it a priority. For my recruiting team, we made that as part of our objectives and KPI. And one way we measured that is we would talk to every candidate at the end of the process with a survey and ask them questions what went right? What went wrong? What can we do to make this better? And we just made that a focus. And it's something that you can get better at the more that you do and the more that you listen to candidates. Yeah, that's really interesting. How much do you think out there of companies that you work with now really focus on that process? What amount of institutional effort goes into goes in? And I guess this kind of goes into the how to reclaim engineering hours. But um I guess just talk about like how much institutional energy goes into hiring engineers. A lot of time and energy, especially for companies that are competing f- for the top talent. And I think you'll see, you know, for the Fang or the Big Five, Facebook, Amazon, places like that, they really take candidate experience really seriously and in a different extents. I think you could compare those companies and some are better than the others. But I think the status quo once you get outside of some of the more modern tech companies, is pretty poor. It's more like processing cattle sometimes than really building a process that's humanizing the hiring process. And I think for most companies, recruiting is a cost center. They don't want to spend money. And they're mostly used to being in a position where they can do whatever they want and people just be lucky to get a job there. But I think they're finding, especially given the shortage of tech workers, you can't really do that and compete. You have to really think about the candidate and that experience. And it extends more than just the hiring process, but really the culture. Certainly hiring is really important and it's the beginning of someone's journey with a company. But as software engineers, we do have a lot of different opportunities out there and we want to be at places where we can grow, we have autonomy, and we can help solve the company's problems. First of all, I've never heard the expression fang. <laughs> so I'm guessing that that's Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google? That's correct. That's really funny. I have not heard that. So let's just say outside of fang and definitely outside of technology for non-tech companies that are competing for engineering talent, what competitive advantage can non-tech CIOs and CTOs that are out there, how can they compete with the fang group and others? I think... There are so many interesting problems to solve, and a lot of these non-tech companies are sitting on treasure troves of data and customer bases. As a software engineer, most of us are motivated by hard problems, and a lot of these companies have a lot of really interesting problems. And I think as a CIO or a CTO, you have to be able to sell what's awesome at your company. And working at Netflix and Amazon and these other companies could be a a lot of interesting challenges because they're in high growth, high scale opportunities. But I think you really do find that banks and other industries also have very interesting challenges as well. And if you can articulate that, I think you have a, a really big opportunity to get great people as well. We are motivated by the problems to solve. I think that's a great insight. And we've interviewed on this podcast companies that are in manufacturing or things like that. You know, a friend of the podcast is in IT at a large retail company. And the project that he did overhauled something like 300 million credit cards or something like that. I mean, like this massive number. I mean, his project was this huge, huge scale. And it's a, it was a very technical project and it was something very difficult to work on. But that was what was so excited about it. 
is that he was able to manage that. I mean, is that the type of problems that you're talking about? Especially when you're talking about machine learning and data, like are those the kind of problems that you're saying like these could be enormous and revenue generating problems? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, certainly, like you said, for the machine learning and big data side, there are a lot of companies sitting on tons of data. But I also think just even on the user interface and interacting with customers, there's so much opportunity to redefine a lot of the interfaces that companies have with with customers. I think users nowadays just have much greater expectations, you know, using iPhones and Apple TVs and Android devices. We have a different expectation on what we want from software. And there is so much software that many of us interact with that was written many, many years ago that could really be improved and be better. And this is even smaller things in the world like governments, right? Education, healthcare, you know, all of these industries have interesting and challenging problems from moving from the past and into a modern time. And if you're a talented software engineer, there are so many interesting problems to solve, and many of which are happening outside of the Bay Area. Let's talk a little bit about speed. Obviously, you know, like the adage of first to contact, first to contract, right? Definitely true with recruiting, where if you can bring that person through the hiring process, through your funnel, fast, efficiently, in a way that is fun and respectful and gives them an opportunity to meet the team and feel excited. What are some best practices? Like, how are people doing that in the field? How are leaders doing that with engineers and technical talent where they can kind of develop a faster advantage? Yeah, so, I mean, measure, right? You have to start with measuring. So having good data on your process, where are the gaps happening? One of the things that we do at Carrot that I think is really interesting is we interview 24-7. For most companies, you're sort of limited Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, when your employees want to interview. But being able to interview outside of that workday lets you move faster than other companies. It's also incentivizing your team. You know, once you're measuring this, your team will probably figure out many ways on how they can speed stuff up. There's probably redundant parts of your process. Uh, a lot of the, the companies that we work with do, you know, phone screen rounds, coding tests, hiring manager phone calls, multiple rounds of on-sites. And I think what you're seeing is a trend of reducing that down to what's the core signals that we need to make a decision? How can we move this faster? Centralized interviewing helps a lot as well by having clear definitions of what signals that you're looking for and how you collect that, you can move faster because once you have that data, you can make a faster decision. So I think there's many different techniques that people are using, but a lot of it really comes down to you know measuring where the time is going and then trying to either reduce it or reorder things around so that you could be that first person giving that candidate an offer and, and really have a better chance at them then, you know, if your process takes weeks and weeks and weeks, and, and by the time you make that offer, they have six or seven other offers, and, and you know, your chances of, of closing them become much, much smaller. Yeah, I think that's so true. And I think that it really just shows when you are quick to make decisions. And obviously, I've heard the adage, the hire slow, fire fast sort of a thing. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about like the speed in making the decision. We're talking about the speed in the process of, how many, how many gaps are there between talking to the candidate from one interview to the next, right? We're talking about like slowing that down. It's not about making rash decisions or quick decisions. It's about making sure that there's not time gaps in between the speed of the actual interview process, right? Yeah, so I mean, generally you see that they take a long time, mostly just waiting back and forth and just these multiple rounds. But the actual decision making is the same. You know, once you collect that information, and typically what companies do is they might have a round table where, you know, the hiring managers and everyone gets together and sort of takes that information and makes that hiring decision or a hiring committee of some sort. And it's really getting to that point faster, but then really still being thoughtful in that decision making. So, yeah, we're not saying make faster decisions necessarily, but get to the point where you can make that decision much faster. And as anyone who's gone through hiring processes, there's just so many obstacles and hoops to jump from, and a lot of it can be eliminated. What's the biggest mistake that you made early on in hiring engineers when you were at Yelp? You know, the biggest mistake, and we started in 2004, basically, was diversity. I think it took me a long time to realize that the things that I were doing, which 
were optimizing for finding candidates just like myself was very detrimental to building a diverse team. And at the time, I started to really kind of realize that, you know, we already had 30 or 40 engineers on the team. And then to go back and sort of rethink how we do diversity, it's much harder to do that the longer that you wait. And that's something I definitely learned at Yelp. You know, today Yelp, I think, is doing an amazing job with DNI, but it's been a long journey to get there for them. What is your favorite interview question? <laughs> I don't know if I have a favorite interview question anymore. I do like to ask candidates questions about the company that I work for that they're applying to and what they would change if they could work here. I always love to hear that outside perspective of somebody coming in and what the impact that they'd want to have. So I, I love questions around that in, in particular. Like a little bit of kind of constructive criticism. Hey, what would you change? Yeah, like I mean, it? you know, I mostly work in early stage startups and we have huge problems that we're trying to solve. And I am looking for people who think about problems differently than we are. So I love to hear sort of, usually towards the end of the process is when the hiring manager kind of comes in, that might be me. You know, they've learned a lot about the company. They learned about our processes. You know, what are they going to do to raise the bar here? What are they going to do to take, you know, whether it's Carrot or, or Yelp or whatever company I'm working at to the next level? All right. So let's do the lightning round. Are you ready? Let's do it. Lightning round is presented by Salesforce Lightning Platform. What app are you using on your phone that is the most fun? MLB app. app. I'm a huge baseball nut. Ooh, that's a good one. That's a fun app. What about your favorite time-saving tool? Having an agenda for every meeting. That's a great answer. Are you using any chatbots? I am not. What about AI? Siri, does that count? <laughs> yeah, that definitely counts. What's your favorite team? I grew up in St. Louis. It's the Cardinals. All right. Little uh, poo hole snake in there. Uh, he left us to L.A., so nowadays it's Matt Carpenter Nation, I suppose. But I feel like he's like the original, like the OG of, I feel I thought everyone still loves him. I think we've moved on. We love him. <laughs> he did a great <laughs> job for back in the day. Hopefully he might come back and retire as a Cardinal, although I think the Angels paid him a lot not to. That's a great point. Do you have a favorite podcast? The Mission. Yeah, there we go. Great organic plug. I did not ask for that. Uh, favorite recent book you've read? I just read The Three-Body Problem. Oh, what's that? It's a book by a Chinese author, Liu, L-I-U, I believe. It's a science fiction book about aliens and first contact. It, it spans, it's a trilogy that spans about two or 3,000 years, starting from like the 1960s to going forward. But what's really interesting about it, it's written by China's most famous science fiction author. And I've mostly read science fiction from the Western world where, you know, NASA and the United States are sort of the center of everything. And it's really fascinating to read a book from China's perspective and their space program and, and their involvement in that. And there's a lot of history in that book, too, about the Mao and Cultural Revolution and a lot of things that I learned from it. So it's a perhaps maybe the, the best science fiction book I've read in a decade. That's really interesting. I'd never thought of that that Area 51 and all the things that we associate with science fiction for other cultures is not at all there. Yeah, you know, we live in an American world and in that perspective, but China and, of course, Russia and other countries have also space programs and, and science fiction. And so it's a really interesting different perspective. Any favorite shows that you're watching? My guilty pleasure with TV shows right now is Penn and Teller's Fool Me. I love trying to figure out how the magic tricks work on that show. Nice. Favorite one day getaway in Seattle? San Juan Islands. Beautiful place. You can see orcas in the water. Washington State's very amazing, especially for someone who comes from California. I have never been. We've had a few interviews with people in Seattle, and I really need to get up there. Summer is absolutely gorgeous. Better than California. The other eight months, if you like San Francisco's foggy weather, you'll love it up here. <laughs> yeah, indeed. What about thing you're most excited about for the future of technology? I'm very excited by artificial intelligence. I think the future of automation and really getting rid of a lot of the things that humans don't like to do and computers love to do, it's super exciting to me and, and what really drives me. Best advice for a first-time CTO? Invest in your people. You can't do everything as a CTO. You really need a great team around you that's both diverse and backgrounds, but also in ways that they solve problems. Awesome. That's it. That's all we got for the lightning round. Sweet. All right. Any other final pieces of advice for CEOs or CTOs out there that are looking for engineers and ways that they could kind of 
improve their team's asking of questions, asking the right questions? Yeah, so you should have the questions that you want to ask determined beforehand. I think you quite often just see an interviewer going into a room without really an agenda or you know a list of questions. Yeah. So I do think if you sit down and you work backwards from the competencies that that job requires and try to really figure out what is it that we're trying to assess for and come up with those questions beforehand and have those written down, I do think that you'll make better use of that time and you'll collect a lot better data that will help you make that decision better later. And really at the end of the day, when you're comparing those candidates, having that similar set of questions and answers gives you just more confidence in your decision making. Awesome. That's it. Any final thoughts? This was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks so much for hanging out, Neil. We appreciate it. Likewise. Thank you again to our friends at Salesforce. IT Visionaries is brought to you by the Lightning Platform by Salesforce, a leading cloud platform that makes building AI-powered apps faster and easier. With Salesforce, now everyone can build apps for their organization. Learn more at salesforce.com slash buildapps.